He's an Iraq veteran. Everybody give it up for Nathan, please. Okay, so uh, I just came out here today uh, to tell my story, really. Uh, you know, uh, I wanted to address some of the things that had already been spoken of. Uh, it is true that uh, people are, uh, we call it being back intact. Uh, I, was, I was an infantryman in Iraq. My job was uh, to go after these bad guys uh, and to take them away in the middle of the night from their families uh, so they've never, sometimes never be seen again. Uh, talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, but uh, I just want to say I appreciate all of, all of, your, uh, all of your support. Uh, I know that you guys love the troops. I really do appreciate it. Uh, uh, so anyways, like I said, my name is Nathaniel Garrick. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my life. I joined the Army in February 2001 at the age of 17 with the consent of my parents. I knew there was a large probability that I would be called to defend my country at the time. Seven months later, on September 11th of that year, I knew that it was no longer probable. It was guaranteed. Fast forward to April of 2003. I was in Fort Benning, Georgia, undergoing the secondary phase of military school where I could be training. After airborne school, I was given a leave of absence. I went home to Orem for two weeks, uh, spent some time with my family and friends, said goodbye to them, knowing that there was a possibility that I would never see any of them again. When I reported to my unit, uh, I was told not to unpack my bags. Two weeks later, I was in Kuwait. A week later, I met the men I would spend the next nine months of my life with. Small base near a ghetto, 20 miles south of Baghdad. I met my, my new brothers. The first night, the first night in Iraq, our base came under small arms fire and indirect fire through mortars and AK-47s. That night prepared me for the person that I needed to become. Not the person I wanted to be, but the person that I needed to be. While I won't say much about what did happen, I will leave it su sufficient to say that people died. Fighters from both factions died, innocent people died, children died, and in one instance, had his hand blown off due to a reckless and vile soldier that was in my unit. Women lost their sons and husbands. In the middle of the night, we took every male over the age of 12 in an area about the size of Pleasant Grove and detained them. Their loved ones were given no information as to where they were going, what charges were to be brought up against them, when they would be returned, or if they would even ever be returned. This kind of mission was routine and repeated in several cities and villages a number of times. I could go with I could go on with a list the size of a phone book about all the bad things that happened in that country, but I won't. I want to shine some light on what happened there as well, and there was a lot of good that took place. secured to the best of our ability and for a very large and varied population. Many times we would get a report about someone who had been shot. Sometimes we would even take them to the Iraqi hospital. There was a high probability that they were the ones who fired upon us that last uh, the night before. Uh, they would receive the treatment they needed and uh, be released. We did our best to restore power and provide clean drinking water to, to the area. We guarded schools where young girls were able to go learn outside of their home for the first time in their lives. My first job was one of the sweetest, I know the sweetest moments I can remember was when a young girl waved to me from her house and blew me a kiss. Kids would chase our hummers, saying, Mr. Mr. Cacao, Cacao, or Mr. Mr. Water, Water, asking for chocolate or water, or Go Bush, Yay Bush. I was given a little, a little over five minutes with an army therapist where I was asked a number of yes or no questions concerning possible trauma experienced while I was in country uh, before I returned to the United States. There were no follow-ups of any kind. The atmosphere in a combat troop like mine was of this ideology. If you're physically injured, see the medic. If you're lacking any proper equipment, 
to the supply sergeant. If your weapon is faulty, go to the armory. If you're worried about morale, keep it to yourself. If you're afraid, keep it to yourself. If you're having a hard time dealing with a lack of sleep you've been receiving, keep it to yourself. If you've been having doubts about the mission, the protocol, or procedure, keep it to yourself. If you've been experiencing depression, anxiety, paranoia, or have had any type of mental issues, absolutely always keep this to yourself. At the end of the deployment, I was again given two weeks of leave. My mother patted me down head to toe to make sure I was okay. I still have no idea how much she suffered every night I was gone. As soon as I returned to my unit, my own problems began, began to become apparent. Almost every single soldier in my company became weekend alcoholics. In the maybe I can have a running joke. Thanks for your patience. Uh, we have a running joke in the 80s, I think, that the devil lays on our shoulders, sent for Alcoholics Anonymous. For the majority of the people in the unit, it did, including yours truly. I had been unable to sleep for a number of days when I lived in the barracks. I couldn't, or just plain didn't get the help I needed. I was dealing with things I couldn't understand at the time, and some of them I still don't. I was admitted to a psychiatric ward three months after my return to my lab. Before I was released from the hospital, I was asked a simple question. Do you want to stay in the army? It was one of the toughest questions that I ever had to answer. I told them I did not. My unit then treated me like garbage. Some friends distanced themselves. Others became new enemies. While others grew closer to me as, as they had felt my pain as well. One soldier was admitted to the same ward I was in two days after I had left the hospital. I wish I could say that this story ended there. When I finally came back home to Utah, I was like a child lost at a Walmart. I don't know where to go, or what to do. It was literally impossible for me to relate to anyone I knew. After years of intense inpatient and outpatient treatment, I became a man you see today. Healthy, with most of the invisible scars now left in Iraq. Though I don't, I don't think I will ever feel entirely. Mine is a story of victory. Sadly, and for me, understandably, many soldiers, for reasons that I cannot possibly put into words, choose to take their own life and are finally given peace. I am not here today to tell you what you think, what to think about. Uh, I am not here today to tell you what to think about concerning the war on terror. I don't. I don't think you can fight any type of idea or ideology. I don't think that my, my Muslim brothers deserve the prejudice we most assuredly project them to them daily. But I am just one voice. It's been said that no one understands the importance of peace than one who has been through the crucible of war. I am not you, and you are not me, so I cannot answer the validity of this statement. I just wanted you to think. Not this way or that, but just to think. Thank you for your time.